Seeking mental health care can be overwhelming and even scary, but it doesn't have to be. I'm Dr. Josephine McNary, and I'm committed to making this process easier for you. Each week, my expert guest and I unravel a different form of therapeutic intervention in order to bring comfort and understanding and to help you get back to your true self. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Mind Stories. Today, I'm pleased to have on as our guest, Dr. Linda Baggett. Dr. Baggett is a licensed psychologist and CEO founder of Well Women Psychology, specializing in women's mental health. She has devoted her career to helping women live the best lives and has particular expertise in trauma, sexuality, body acceptance, and reproductive mental health. She is based in Manhattan Beach in Los Angeles and sees clients online in California, Illinois, New York, Virginia, and Washington. She earned her PhD in counseling psychology from the University of Memphis and has extensive experience in creating gender-specific, trauma-informed, and intersectional feminist therapy programs for women. Today, we talk about body image and trauma and how this relates to intimacy. Welcome, Dr. Baggett. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. So we are talking about, we're going to talk about a very interesting topic today. And it's, um, you know, you're a psychologist, you work with body image, you work with trauma, and you also work with like issues surrounding intimacy. And it's, I think this will be a really interesting, exciting topic to kind of talk about all those, those three things today. Yeah, I think so too. I find these are topics that touch a lot of people's lives and that you know, to your point are pretty interesting to think about. Yeah. So, okay. My question is, these are three sign of separate things. So do you, I mean, do you call yourself a sex therapist or? That's a good question. I do. Um, and I certainly use sex therapy interventions, but I also don't think of myself as just a sex therapist either. I really think of myself as a therapist that really is focused in on women's issues of which trauma and body image are disproportionately affecting women Mm. and both of them also impact sexuality. So I sort of think about these three things as sort of points in a triangle. And there's a lot of interconnections and overlap between the three of them. Why this certain triangle in psychology? Like what, what made you interested in this? specific? Yeah, it's a good question. So I knew I wanted to be a psychologist from the time I was a teenager. And as a teen, I was definitely the friend that all the girls in my friend group came to for advice and information about sex. I was reading books in the library and felt very empowered in that way. And was sort of like a young sex educator um, before my time and then went into psychology. And I think the body image stuff came in because, you know, who is immune from that? I mean, I've experienced that all of my friends dealt with it. Then as I started working clinically, I just noticed that body image and trauma were coming up over and over again. And even specific body image concerns after people experience trauma, especially sexual trauma. So over time, these longstanding interests I had just, I, they kept converging and I just kept getting more and more interested in that. And over time kind of made it my specialty. I wonder if you could maybe create in your mind kind of a typical case that might come through your door in terms of maybe a reason why someone might come to you specifically? It's a good question. So I think clients come in kind of a few different routes. I have folks that come in and their initial goal is that their sex life isn't what they want it to be. And they recognize that there's some struggles that they're having internally that are affecting that. So sometimes people come in with that as their goal. I think what's more common though, is that people are really struggling with either their body image or a past trauma that they just feel like they can't quite move forward from or both. And then as we get into the work, we start to explore ways that's showing up in their lives, like in relationships or, um, self-esteem. And one of the ways that we talk about it showing up is in the bedroom. How does it show up in their intimate life? Because if you think about it, having sex with somebody that you care about is pretty much the height of vulnerability (laughs) for all of us. And so if you're already feeling extra vulnerable because you're so uncomfortable in your body or your body has been harmed um, in a way that violated your boundaries and consent, those things are going to feel even more vulnerable Mm -hmm. in that very intimate situation. So 
I find that it's very rare um, that these things don't impact our intimate lives. Also, it's interesting, you know, research shows that all kinds of trauma um, and PTSD, it negatively impact sex lives. And that is even more the case when the trauma has been sexual of some nature. So like, um, or interpersonal of some nature, so sexual assault, child physical abuse, um, intimate partner violence, those things tend to really show up because in that situation, you've been harmed by a person who should have been caring about you and who you should have felt safe with. And so that makes it really scary to be vulnerable and intimate with people down the line. And maybe I'm wondering if we can maybe rewind um, just in case the listener is wondering, like, well, what, what are body image questions that people might have, right? Yeah, I think it's a good, it's a good question. So, um, you know, what I'm hearing a lot, especially, you know, in case people are listening to this way in the future, in the year 2023, right, kind of coming out of the pandemic, is that people are now being seen way more than they have been the past two to three years when so much has been virtual and there's been so much isolation. And so what I'm noticing is a lot of body image concerns that were kind of always there are now really feeling intense for people now that they're feeling so exposed after such a long period of not being seen. And frankly, a lot of people's bodies have changed over the pandemic. I mean, many of us have been more sedentary or had our routines changed. We've been juggling multiple stressors. We've all survived the trauma of a pandemic. I mean, there's a lot going on. It's pretty incredible that our bodies have made it through that, but many people's bodies have changed. And so I'm noticing a lot of people feeling very anxious about dating, putting themselves out there or having to give a talk at an in-person work day and then having people see them or feeling uncomfortable in the clothes that they have and like they can't find anything that they feel okay in or you know, we're kind of now in this period of time where January is so much pressure to diet um, and to lose weight, new year, new me vibes. And then also thinking ahead to summer, um, I was just speaking with somebody earlier who was already feeling very anxious about summer and the exposure that comes with bathing suits and being at the pool and those kinds of things. So Those are the kinds of questions I hear a lot. Um, Also, I think it's pretty common for people to feel embarrassed to let their partners see them naked or with the lights on or to have their partners touch the areas of their body that they feel more self-conscious about. Certainly, having children also really radically changes your body, and that can be hard in a culture that is very clearly telling us all that there is one right way to have a body. Mm -hmm. Um, and most people don't fit into that very narrow band, um, of what's okay. So those are the kinds of questions that I'm hearing come up a lot. And then you, we had talked about a little bit, like how trauma then is incorporated into that. So I guess maybe more of a discussion about, okay, so someone has this like image of how there should be, but where does trauma actually fit into all of those? I think there's a few different ways. One, I think people can have really traumatic experiences specifically about body image. And what I mean by that is like um, people who got really horrifically bullied about their weight as a child, that stays with you. That doesn't go away. Um, Or for instance, um, I've had clients who have been in an intimate relationship with their partner and where it was very abusive. And there was a lot of verbal abuse about how ugly and disgusting the person's body was and how they would never find anybody else that would want them. And so sometimes traumas are very body image specific, but even when they're not, it's very common to feel a lot of disgust or shame about your body after traumatic experience, especially sexual assault or physical abuse. Um, And I think in general, if you've had many experiences, which could include trauma that have sort of given you the message that your worth really lies in how appealing or useful your body is to other people, um, then that can very quickly kind of tangle up body and worth and trauma in a pretty significant way. Hmm. It's very complex. Yeah. There's a lot of layers. (laughs) Yeah. How do you start? You know, I really try to 
meet clients where they're at with what they are wanting to work on initially. Um, and so, you know, in general, I think we talk about, you know, when did these problems and difficulties start? When are they present? Are there times that there aren't present? Um, you know, have there been times where they've been able to enjoy sex and where it felt safe and connecting with their partner? If so, what can we learn about that? Um, or in what ways do these things show up in their intimate relationships with their partners? So I think the beginning stage of therapy with these things is really just a lot of exploration. Like, how did you come to learn this about your body? Or when did it start to feel unsafe to be in your body? Um, and then from there, really starting to understand the impact that it's having on the person's life. And based on what we kind of find together, then deciding where we want to intervene. Like, maybe the place to start is by working on unlearning that you're only that the main thing contributing to your worth is how your body appears. Or maybe we first start working on learning how to undo some of the shame and disgust that was a result of a sexual assault and, and learning to feel more safe in your body. So it really kind of depends where um, where these things are coming from. But I think, you know, the place to start is really just to explore that with the client and also to establish trust and safety, right? Like it's, it can be scary to talk to a stranger at first, you know, about these super intimate and vulnerable topics. And so, you know, I also want to go at a client's pace and have them feel comfortable and establish some safety and trust, even just with me and the client first as well. To what degree? I mean, you talk, cause I know you do work from this like lens of like health at every size, right? Yeah. And so, I mean, maybe you can talk a little bit about that and I'll yeah, say, happy like, to. To what degree do you try to incorporate like acceptance into therapy? Well, I think acceptance is a really hard thing to do in a culture that's constantly telling you your body is wrong, but it's also a really vital part of healing and learning to connect with safety and pleasure in your own body. Um, I think a lot of people sort of have this like, well, when my body looks the way I want it to, then I will be allowing myself to feel pleasure. And I just think it's really important to recognize that everybody deserves to feel safety and pleasure in their bodies as they exist now and in any form it may exist in the future. Um, I mean, you know, people say nothing certain but death and taxes, but I would add changes to your body to that as well. I mean, it's just unavoidable. Um, and I think really learning to interrogate where did we learn to feel the way we feel about our bodies? Babies are not born hating their bodies. We learn to hate our bodies because we're just constantly flooded with messages from our culture at large, the media doctors, fitness professionals, family, friends, partners that teach us about what bodies are okay and what aren't. And so you mentioned the health at every size perspective. That perspective is really one that is a weight neutral perspective um, and that all people, regardless of their size, deserve to have compassionate, respectful care and move toward physical and emotional health, regardless of what size they are currently at. It also really recognizes kind of the social justice component about how anti-fat bias is really pretty discriminatory. I mean, it's really an example of that is it's really hard to feel okay about your body when you don't have a selection of fun, cute clothes to pick from, you know, and that's not the fault of the body. That's a really complicated set of factors about why the fashion industry doesn't bother making a lot of fun, cute clothes at larger sizes. So, you know, it's really important, I think, to look at where did we learn that fatness in particular shapes are bad? Because that those beliefs and, and messages that we internalize are really what underlies most body image concerns, regardless of if somebody is small or large or somewhere in between. Um, certainly body image struggles impact everybody, but they all kind of come from that same root, that same learning that smaller is better. And so 
we really kind of want to question how healthy that actually is for us. Yeah. I mean, I, we're talking about layers before, right? This yeah. idea is that like a negative sense of your body is one part of the layer, but it, like, there's so much in there that so like from culture, but also from just like, just general sense of self-worth in mm-hmm. general like nothing to do with bot your body, but I mean, it's kind of an outward, um, like obvious representation of just someone's sense of worth that Mm -hmm. far deeper than just like the outward image. Right. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really complex. These layers that you're mentioning are really important to think about with sexual functioning and sexual desire. So the way that that kind of works is our brain has like an excitation system where we recognize sexual stimuli and we get excited and it makes us have desire and wanting to move toward that. And then we have an inhibition system, which is kind of like the brakes. So we've got the gas and the brakes. And these are two systems. You can have something hitting the accelerator, but also slamming on the brakes at the same time. But if something is hitting those brakes, you're not going to be in a place where you can really be in your body, mindfully experiencing pleasure and connection. And so women in particular tend to have more sensitive breaks for the most part. And there's a lot more things jamming on the breaks for women, including things like trauma, low self-worth, feeling worried that your partner doesn't find you attractive, hating the way your stomach looks after giving birth. The, The list goes on and on. It's all kinds of things. Um, so, you know, each of those layers, if, if you've got a lot of things hitting those breaks, you're really going to have difficulties with physical intimacy. So the question about just sexuality, about how trauma might affect kind of the global idea of sexuality and more specifics about just sexual functioning and. Yeah. So I think that both trauma and body image can impact your sex life in kind of generalized ways and then in really specific ways. So generalized ways would be if you're generally feeling uncomfortable in your body and disgust, you're not going to not feel those things also when you're having sex. And similarly with trauma, if you generally feel on edge and unsafe in your body, you're also going to feel that way in the bedroom. But then there's specific effects too. For example, if you are really self-conscious about how your stomach appears. You might avoid particular sexual positions or having sex with the lights on or sex entirely because you don't want your partner to see your stomach, which they will see if you're having sex. Or an example with trauma would be if, if seeing an erect penis, for instance, is a reminder of your sexual assault, when you see that, you are probably going to have a trauma response to that, even though it may be safe with your current partner. And so those are some of the both general and very context specific thing ways these two issues can show up in the bedroom. As you were talking, I'm thinking about, okay, so the reason you were talking about the reason why someone might come in, do goals change over the course of therapy? Oh, yes, absolutely. (laughs) Because I wanted to ask like, okay, what is the ultimate outcome that you're, you're hoping for in, or that a, that a client wants and maybe talking about like what the end goal is in terms of like your work with clients? Yeah, I think, I mean, they absolutely shift with time. And I think they also shift as a client has increased understanding and insight into why they're having the struggles that they're having. Like, for example, I think some common routes that I hear people come into therapy wanting to work on trauma and they're not mentioning anything about sex or body image. But as we kind of get into the work of healing from trauma and unpacking that, we start to discover ways in which it has impacted how they feel about their body and ways it's making it intimacy and vulnerability with their partner difficult. And so then the goal may shift from, I want to heal from trauma to, well, healing from trauma also looks like feeling at home and at peace with my body and being able to really enjoy intimacy with my partner. Or maybe somebody comes in with the goal, I want to feel better about my body. I don't want to hate my body anymore. And then as we start to talk about the different ways that that's showing up for somebody, or maybe some of the really hurtful experiences that contributed to them hating their body, 
you know, then the goal kind of sh- can, I would say the goal, it's not that the goal pivots from like A to B, it's more like the goal sort of becomes more expansive and an including of more things. Right. Um, so those are kind of some of the the common goal meandering paths. I like that because you also think about like the expansion of the goal is to have a fuller, like qu- a fuller quality. Yeah, exactly. In many or, yeah. areas. Or to feel more at peace in, you know, and you don't want to feel in peace at peace only in one way. Like you want to feel at peace kind of across all the domains of your life. Right. Uh, I was also wondering, like, as part of what the work you do is sex therapy, like, do you give, um, I mean, do you give specific exercises or is it more of like an insight based understanding that then leads? Yeah. Yeah. So for example, let's say that somebody was sexually abused by a relative um, and that that was their, all of their early sexual experiences. And that that person was also very critical about their weight and a number of other things. Um, I'm not going to start with those sex therapy kind of specific interventions, but after the insight and exploration phase, we may decide um, to do some gentle exposure work. Yeah. This is assuming that this person has a safe partner to practice with. I would never have somebody practice if their partner was abusive in any way. But um, for instance, maybe they first just start by having um, some naked cuddling time, or that might even be too much at first, right? And just taking sex completely off the table, but just so that the client can practice being seen by a safe person and getting used to that so that the anxiety can kind of dissipate and learning how to both cope with the anxiety, but also practice being mindful and present in her body and attuned to her partner. And then with time kind of upping the ante, maybe we add some kissing or some touching or, um, you know, for, for instance, another thing that we might work on is making eye contact during sex that feels super vulnerable. And if you've been hurt, by partners before, either in a criticism way or a sexual abuse kind of way or any way, you know, that can be really difficult, but that can also be really hurtful to your partner if you never look at them during the act. Um, so those are sort of some specific examples of, of ways we might kind of gradually get, and the key word is gradually, right? Like it's gentle. I'm not going to throw somebody into the deep end of the pool without first teaching them how to swim and it'll be at their pace. <laughs> and I also know that like the topic of sex, specific sex therapy is like a whole nother, like, yes, <laughs> huge <discussion. For> sure. <laughs> but I did want to touch on it a little bit in terms of in case the listeners, like, I don't, what is, yeah, that, I think that it's thing? important to demystify. I mean, also it's never the case that your therapist is going to be like, like there's never any touching no, there's no sexual anything between the therapist and the client. And it would also any specific um, sort of practice assignments like that would only be what was matching the client's values and what they wanted to work up to being able to do. It's It really should be a non-judgmental space where, you know, if it's between consenting adults and nobody's being physically or emotionally harmed, it's all good. And I want to support the client having that in their life if they want to. So then I, the other question I was wondering, I know you talk a lot about mindfulness in your clinical work. Yeah. So mindfulness, um, I think a lot of people think mindfulness is about relaxing and it's nice if that happens, but that's really not what it's about. It's more about learning how to be fully in the present, kind of connected with what's going on inside of you and outside of you. And so if you are not able to be mindful during sex, you know, connected with your physical sensations, the feelings you have toward your partner, it's going to be really hard to enjoy that. And both worrying about your body and how it appears and thinking about past traumas or whether or not you're safe or um, accepted, both of those things are going to be continually pulling your mind out of the present moment and really interfering with sex. So Part of overcoming these two issues in the bedroom in general is learning how to bring your mind back away from those kind of more painful places and into the safety of the present moment. Again, assuming you're with a safe partner um, to really be able to connect with those emotional and physical sensations that you're feeling in the moment. I think 
we, you did a great job in helping <laughs> discuss in a short period of time, <laughs> really complex issues. Yeah. Um, I could talk about it for hours. <laughs> this is just a way for the listener who might be wondering about treatment for themselves, like mm-hmm. what does it look like and how it might move forward and what goals might be and how that might kind of expand over time as well. Um, And I think maybe this is a good time to ask this question of like, if the listener wants to learn more, are there specific like books or things that you, you think are really helpful for them to read about if they're interested in that? Yeah. So probably the best book I can, I always recommend for sexuality for anybody is come as you are by Emily Nagoski. It's fantastic. Um, And she talks about trauma and body image concerns, because those are the two major contributors to what jams on those breaks for people, especially women. So that's a great book. She also has a workbook now um, that goes with that. If folks are looking for something specific about sexual trauma, The Sexual Healing Journey by Wendy Maltz is fantastic. It uses the terminology sexual abuse, but it is relevant for any kind of sexual trauma, even if the client isn't identifying with those particular words. Um, And then for starting to heal body image, I think um, a really great book, it's short and quite empowering to read is um, The Body is Not an Apology by Sonia Renee Taylor. Okay. I'm going to make sure all those are on the um, description of the episode as as well as your information. And on that note, I actually um, have a blog post that lists quite a long list actually of resources, books, podcasts, Instagram accounts, et cetera, to follow for people who are trying to challenge that internalized anti-fat bias and and body image concerns. Um, So happy to provide a link for that as well. Yeah, that would be great. So people people can can look at that as well. Well, I really appreciate you being on. And I, I mean, I've known you as a clinician, but I've never been able to really sit down and really have a conversation of like, I know it's fun to get to chat. (laughs) Yeah. Um, before we say goodbye, my last question of you is to ask if there's anything that you may want to leave the listener with in terms of like last thoughts. You know, I think my parting thought would be that whatever challenges are there for somebody, everybody deserves to feel at peace in their bodies and able to access pleasure with their bodies, whether that's through sex or sharing a meal. And so, you know, there's a lot of things that can make that really hard, but everybody deserves to have that. And there's people that can help you with that. If that's something that you'd like to work on. And it's also not anybody's fault for struggling with those two things. I mean, these problems don't come from nowhere. They come from what's happened to us and what we've learned over our lifetimes. And so it's never anybody's fault if they're struggling with this stuff. It's a good place to end, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks for being on. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was good. I I hope this is helpful for the listener. It was helpful for me. Me too. Me too. All right. Bye. This has been Mind Stories with me, Josephine McNary of Cal Psychiatry. With online psychiatry in California and 13 offices throughout Southern California and the Bay Area, Cal Psychiatry specializes in medication management, ADHD, anxiety disorders, alternative therapies, women's mental health, and more. Visit us at calpsychiatry.com and let us help you get back to your true self. Thanks for listening to Mind Stories and don't forget to subscribe. Subscribe.